He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He all my griefs has taken and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me and Satan tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Good singing tonight. You may be seated. What a good song that is. <clears throat> All right. As far as prayer requests go tonight, we only have one this evening, and that's for Shireen Annick. Shireen is very, very ill tonight. Uh, Rick will be glad to run you through her symptoms after the service if you'd like to hear about them all. But uh, very sick, flu-like symptoms is what she's dealing with. So please be in prayer for her. So let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. We're thankful for your goodness to us. And we do pray your blessing upon the service here as we meet together tonight. Thank you for the family of God and thank you for our regular assemblies. I do pray that you'll please work in our hearts and speak to us as we have need. We think of Shireen tonight, and we sure do love that lady and hate to hear that she's not feeling well. Would you please work in her body and help her to recover and get better soon? Uh, we know that she likes to be active and busy and has work responsibilities, uh, not to mention household responsibilities. And so would you please help her to uh, get better sooner rather than later? I've been ill enough to remember when I thought I might never get better, and I hope that's not the case for her. Let the medicines that she's uh, taking help get rid of it, and we do know that sometimes it's just a matter of time, and it has to run its course, but watch over her and protect her, and I pray you'll bless Rick and help her uh, to get through this as well. Lord, we also thank of Brother Dix uh, that we prayed for a week or so ago. I uh, went back in for surgery, and it seems to have uh, done him some good. He's been up and out and about, and we're thankful for that. Continue to bless his uh, recovery and healing. He wants to be at back at church, thought he would make it last week, and didn't quite get here. So help him to uh, recover, but at the same time, uh, not further injure himself or set himself back. We continue to think of Terry's brother and sister-in-law, uh, Denny and Lorraine, as uh, they're dealing with their cancer and also still having not accepted Christ. Would you please uh, get the gospel to them repeatedly, soften their hearts, and I pray that they'd come to a knowledge of Christ soon. We love you tonight. We ask again your blessing on our service, and we do this in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, remember those, please, and pray about them as you go through your week. Isaiah and Malachi, you may come up and grab your candy baskets. One of these baskets has uh, payday candy bars in it. Let's see who ends up with the paydays. All right, Isaiah has the paydays, so there you go. Uh, Ezekiel, chapters 26 to 48 is where we are this evening. Ezekiel 26 to 48, there aren't a lot of questions here tonight. I have 11 questions. One of them is lengthy and it has 10 answers on its own, but you know how those can go sometimes. So away we go. <clears throat> Question number one, who wrote the book of Ezekiel? Eva. 
Ezekiel. We're throwing that one back out there just to pad the numbers. That's the only reason. Chapter 28. Who is the king of Tyrus? Who is the king of Tyrus? Mother. Satan. That is correct. Now, question number three, and this is where I only want one answer at a time, please. How is he described? Mother. The anointed cherub is correct. Who else? Brent. Perfect in thy ways. Yes. Shannon, I saw you. Okay. I still have eight answers. Brent? Heart was lifted up because of his beauty. That's exactly right. This is chapter 28, by the way. Vicki? Um, yes, that is correct. Russ? Yes. Shannon? Yes. Jeanette. Yes, I'm going to give it to you. You guys are starting to run off the rails, though. You need to circle the wagons again. I'm talking about description of Satan as the king of Tyre. I should probably turn there to give you a little guidance, huh? Ezekiel 28. Vicki. Um, what verse is that? Yeah, we're, we're off track there. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh... No, I'm going to give you that. I'm going to give you that. Okay. Ellen. Uh, you know, Brent has already said that, Ellen, but that was a correct answer. <laughs> That's already been said. I forget who said it. <laughs> Keep going, though. <laughs> You're on the right track. Uh, you know, and, it, and it, you can... You can uh, hmm. Yeah. Oh, Marianne. Yeah, that's not what I'm looking at. Boy, I feel like we've really lost track here of where we need to be. Uh, Jeanette, you were next. Yeah. Mother? Mm, where's that at? Verse 3. Okay, okay. Let's see here. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, yes, I'll give you that one. Sure. Shannon? Where is uh, that? Verse 19. Uh, okay, I'll accept that. We're really off the rails here. And I know, yeah, I, it's, it's hard. Rick? Where's that at? Verse 2. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll accept that. This is a tough 
question because you're you're cherry picking through the the passage. Um, how about I do this? Now I'm going to stick to only the answers I have on my page. How about that? So you're, there are two groups of you that are picking from two different sections of the chapter. You're both in the general vicinity, but I am going to stick to just what I have. Now, and what I want you to do is I want you to think specifically of the devil himself and ask yourself, is this pertaining to him specifically? Vicki. Yes, that is correct. Anybody else? Marianne. Uh, where is that at? Verse 3. Yeah, you know, that kind of goes in with the wiser than Daniel answer, Marianne. And, it, and it's also not on my page, so i got to stick to my page. Good guess. Do these kind of questions frustrate you all? No? Shannon? Yeah, I can't take that. Sorry. It's not on the page. You, you know, the, th the thing is, I, I mean, if you look at it, <laughs> uh, there are some things that stand out clearly. Brent? Yeah, Rick already said that one. Jeanette? Yeah, I think that's already been said and not on my page. I know, yeah. Shannon? I think that was said also. All right, let's do this. Let's walk through it, all right? How many of you do not have a piece of candy yet? Raise your hand. Uh, okay, you guys give each of these hands one piece of candy, please. Uh, <laughs> I'm just trying to, you know, I don't want to mislead you all. Verse 2 of Ezekiel 28. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up. There's one, right? <clears throat> and thou hast said, I am a God. That's two, right? I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God. And Rick's covered that. Uh, Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. That is one. Has someone said that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see here. Then we're going to jump down to verse number 13. Okay. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Is that the devil? Okay. So that was an answer. And I guess we're going through this exercise to show you the way my brain thinks, if you dare to follow it. Uh, every precious stone was thy covering. There's another one. And look, it lists the stones then. Uh, sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle and gold. You never knew Satan was diamond studded, did you? That's why I, I won't buy Shannon any jewelry. I say, that's of the devil, Shannon. We're not going to do that. Uh... Then the workmanship of thy tabrets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. That's another one. Satan is a musical creature. He is a living musical instrument. Isn't that interesting? Uh, verse number 14. Thou art the anointed cherub. Okay, Lucifer, Satan, was the go to angel for the Lord, the anointed cherub. Uh, and I have set thee so uh, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. And there's another one. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stone of fire that was said. Thou wast perfect in all thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. That's another one, perfect until iniquity was found in thee. Oh, uh, let's see here. Uh, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. That's another. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mount of God. That's another one. Cast out of heaven. 
uh, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Uh, and then verse 17, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. So those were the things that I had. Does that make sense? It's interesting how many that you read that I didn't quite have, but then how many that I did have that you missed. Uh, you know, particularly the Eden part, the uh, coverings in beauty and, and precious stones and so forth. All right, so there's that. So everybody has had at least one piece of candy by now. Is that right? Okay, good. I'm just trying to be just. I don't want to set you up for failure. That's not my goal here. All right, chapter 33. Let's move on. When is blood required of the watchman? When is blood? Ellen? I'll accept that because that's the application of this story. I will take that, Ellen. That's good. Rick? Correct. That's correct. So that's the, the literal understanding of the book of Ezekiel. The watchman was like the soldier on guard. And his job was to watch during the night watches uh, for in, invasions or intruders. And they were to sound the alarm if intruders were coming. If they failed to sound the alarm, then he was held accountable for the death of the people. If he sounded the alarm, but the people didn't respond properly, that's on them. So that's, and then Alan brought it home with the soul winning application there. Our job is to preach the gospel and tell people. If we fail to do that, then it's on us. If, however, we do it and they reject it, it's on them. That makes sense? Okay, good. Uh, chapter number 33 still. What do the people's hearts go after? What do the people's hearts go after? Still in 33, yep. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Good guess. Brett? Covetousness. <laughs> I, I wanted to see that response. <laughs> so she, she gives us this long, drawn-out answer, and then Brent just throws one word, so she gets that, <laughs> that, that scowl. Chapter 34. <laughs> There are three answers here. Let's break these down for you. Is there a nursery tonight? No. no? Where's Nicole? Nursery. She's waiting. waiting? It's 20 after 7. Uh, somebody go get them, please. Winston, thank you. All right. What charges did the Lord make against the shepherds? Those of you who are nursery workers, if there's children down there, I'm happy for you to stay down there. If there are no children, please come up and be part of the service. Uh, all right. What charges did the Lord make against the shepherds? So I got three answers here. Let's separate them into three questions, please. Shannon. Yes, they fed themselves, but not the flock. Very good. Two more answers. And Anna? That's, well, no, uh, that's, that's sort of what she just said. Jeanette? Mm, no. Here, let me read it again. What charges, so these are accusations, did the Lord make against the shepherd? So three things the shepherds were doing wrong. Lucy? Is that what it says? Okay, I'll accept that, sure. I didn't have it, but I have two others still. Ellen? Yeah, that's what Lucy just said. You're doing a good job repeating other people's answers tonight, Ellen. <laughs> I'm just having fun with you, that's, that's all. <laughs> Jeanette? No, I don't have that. Russ? 
Sorry, I don't have that. Boy, I, I have really created a terrible quiz apparently tonight, haven't I? What else? Anybody else? Does anyone see they ruled with cruelty? Yes, it's in verse 4. Verse 4. Is it near they fed themselves but not the flock? It's, yes, it's the next verse. Okay, does it say they did not seek the lost? Is that what Lucy said? Yeah, okay. So, yeah, they fed themselves but not the flock. They did not seek the lost and they ruled with cruelty. Those three things there. All right, chapter 37. <laughs> chapter 37. What did the bones represent? What did the bones represent? What did the bones represent? Jeanette? Don't read me the Bible. Give me an answer. What do the bones represent? <laughs> well, the whole chapter is about bones, <laughs> so you'd go on a while. Chapter 37, Valley of the Dry Bones. Shannon, what did the bones represent? <laughs> You're welcome. Jeanette, I'm sorry. <laughs> Marianne. Sorry. Vicky? Um, the bones are the whole house of Israel. That's correct. Israel. The bones are the whole house of Israel. Does it say that verbatim? Yeah. What verse? 11. Verse 11. The bones are the whole house of Israel. Is that what you were going to say, Ellen? No. No? <laughs> okay. Would you like to say it now? <laughs> <laughs> chapter 40 chapter 40 ay 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 i think i'm just going to have you beginners read the whole book of ezekiel so we only have to do the first quiz chapter 40 what did the man measure or with what did the man re measure the building with what did the man measure the building Jeanette? a reed is correct glory glory hallelujah <laughs> Chapter 43, what is God's voice like? What is God's voice like? Talon. Uh, you know, good guess, Talon, not in this passage. Ellen. Yes, ma'am, that is right. <laughs> Many waters. Chapter 44. Chapter 44, what were the priests to teach the people? Chapter 44. Lucy. That's right. The difference between the holy and the profane. Chapter 47. Last question. For what? <laughs> We're all happy, aren't we? For what will the leaves of the tree be used? Dan. Dan. You know, I'm going to give that to you only to end this quiz. You, you, you're giving me an answer from Revelation 22, but I'll accept it because medicine is the answer uh, for this question as well. So I'll accept it. All right. Who didn't get a piece of candy tonight? Did anyone not get a piece? Not a single solitary piece? Winston did not get a piece. So Malachi helped that brother out. Anybody else not get candy tonight? Oh, you don't want it when? Wow, look at him. All right, gentlemen, you may take up to four pieces of candy each. The rest of us, turn our Bibles to Acts chapter 5, please. Uh, I do have a handout here, gentlemen, if you're so inclined. Thank you very much. Acts chapter number 5 to start out with. We're just going to finish the month with these enemies of soul winning lessons I just want to point out to you, I tell you, we were talking this week, we've covered a lot of territory. We've covered the modern Bible translation issue this year. We've covered Calvinism this year. We've covered salvation at per Catholicism uh, this year. And now we're covering these enemies of soul winning. We've done a lot of, uh, of uh, 
doctrinal studies here this year. If you have a spare, Brent, I'll take it so I can try to stay true. If we play our cards right, I'll have you out of here at the top of the hour. Thank you, friend. All right. Question number one, blank number one. Lifestyle evangelism is an enemy of soul winning. Lifestyle evangelism. If you've never heard that term before, I'm curious, how many of you have never heard the term lifestyle evangelism? Okay, very good. Uh, the term lifestyle evangelism uh, de describes the belief and practice that you shouldn't verbally witness to people, that you should just let them watch your life, and as they see you live for God, it will draw them to you, and they will ask you how to be saved. That's lifestyle evangelism. It's more common than you might realize. Uh, there are many, many people who are softening nearly every position we've ever held as Christian people because we're too concerned or worried about offending the lost world. Now, I'm not for being a jerk as a Christian. You know, we mentioned praying for your meal publicly Sunday night, I think we did. And, uh, and I believe that you ought to. Uh, I also believe that you ought to without being a jerk about it. Right When you go to pray for your meal, I don't think you should pray loud enough that the whole restaurant can hear you. You're just being obnoxious. Uh, you're not doing the cause of Christ any favors. I've actually seen people before uh, stand on a chair, call the whole restaurant to attention, and ask them to be quiet while they prayed for their meal. That's ridiculous. And, uh, and I think that kind of behavior does turn people away from the gospel. And so because of a few lunatics, bad apples if you were, uh, we've seen Christians really dial back their stand for Christ. And they don't want to offend anyone, uh, and yet they've clearly never read their Bible because Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I will divide families, he said. I will divide husbands and wives, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, fathers and their children. And so anytime you bring Jesus into conversation, he's going to cause a divide. Uh, a lot of times pastors will be asked to preach, uh, I'm sorry, to pray for uh, governmental and public ceremonies. And very often they'll be asked to not use the name of Jesus Christ in doing so. They, they say, please pray to God but do not mention Jesus Christ. It is divisive. And it shouldn't surprise us because Jesus told us himself that his name would be divisive. And so in an effort to refrain from offending people, uh, there's a group of Christians who believe that uh, we shouldn't verbally witness to people unless they approach us about it first. That is not a very effective method of evangelism. There is one time in the Bible where someone came to a Christian and asked how to be saved. That was the Philippian jailer. And he did that because there was an earthquake and he thought all of the prisoners were going to escape. And so, uh, in fact, he was going to commit suicide, but then after Paul stops him, he asks Paul, what must I do to be saved? I'll tell you this, I've been a Christian for 35 years. No one has ever asked me how to be saved. I have always initiated the conversation every single time. So let's look at it scripturally though. We don't want to just take it anecdotally. Let's look at it scripturally. Let's pray briefly please. Father help us as we look into the Bible at this matter of uh, soul winning versus lifestyle evangelism. Help us to rightly divide the word of truth and see what it is we're to be doing and how we're to be doing it. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Acts chapter number 5, that's New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. 
Verse number 28 is where we'll start. This is Peter and John. They have been arrested for preaching. And Peter says here, saying, did not, I'm sorry, this is the council, but then Peter will respond. Uh, did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in his name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your lifestyle and intended to bring this man's blood upon us. No? Your doctrine. How do you fill a city with your doctrine, do you reckon? By teaching and preaching that doctrine. Doctrine is taught and preached. You can't live out doctrine effectively. You can't fill a city. Now, don't crucify me just yet. We're going to get there because uh, some of you, are, you might already be sharpening your, your axe. I don't know. Then Peter said, verse 29, and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And any time that man passes a rule or a law that contradicts one of God's rules or laws, then we're to obey God and not man. For instance, if uh, our city ever passed an ordinance that said you can no longer tell people about Jesus Christ, we should do it anyways. Uh, hopefully that never happens. We don't ever want to see that. <clears throat> but uh, you never know. When, uh, when we were in college, the city of Dyer, Indiana, uh, passed a law that said there's no more door-to-door -door, uh, evangelism allowed within the city limits. And they passed that law pretty much because of us, the, the college and the church. And so they called our pastor and said, hey, just want you to know the law passed uh, unanimously, no more door-to-door. And he said, well, what'll happen if uh, we showed up over there? And they said, we'll put you in jail. And he said, how big is your jail? <laughs> and Dyer, Indiana, only at the time probably had three to 5,000 people. So you can imagine the jail might have six or eight cells at most. And so that coming Saturday, we brought about 3,000 people soul winning in Dyer, Indiana, enough to match their population. And, uh, and so needless to say, the, the law was pulled from the books and, or they didn't enforce it one or the other. Uh, whenever man passes a law that God's law contradicts, we obey God. And that's what Peter's telling them here. But the point of the, the passage in reading it is to say that they filled Jerusalem with their doctrine. Let's go to Acts chapter number 20 and verse number 20. We are going to use our Bibles a good bit tonight, so crack your knuckles and, and bend the spine back of it and let's cover it. Acts 20, 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. This is the Apostle Paul preaching here. He says, but have showed you and taught you publicly and from house to house. So, so far in the book of Acts, we find two instances where verbal confrontations with the gospel and even door-to-door -door evangelism is going on. Now, let me just say, I am not opposed to people living out uh, godly Christian character traits before people. I am opposed to lifestyle evangelism being the only method of witnessing to people. And that's what the proponents of lifestyle evangelism say. In fact, there are several names for lifestyle evangelism. The first is lifestyle evangelism, so I didn't bother giving you a, a blank for that. The next is non-confrontational soul winning. Non-confrontational soul winning. It's, it, the way people use words tells you a lot about them, don't they? Like, for instance, there's the, uh, it, it's, it, you have the pro-life movement and you have the pro-abortion movement. Well, wait a minute. Why isn't it the pro-death movement? If it's pro-life, why isn't it pro-death? Because pro-death would get people's attention, wouldn't it? And not in a good way. So it's the pro-choice. That's a better spin yet, isn't it? Not only are we not pro-death, we don't even like pro-abortion, we're pro-choice. 
And so you convince a whole lot of people by the way you put it. Look at the use of the word confrontational. That almost sounds like they think we're running up to people, grabbing them by the lapels, shaking them good and hard and saying, you need to get saved or you're going to burn in hell. That sounds pretty confrontational, doesn't it? Uh, no one does that. No one with a brain does that. We simply approach people with the gospel message. So they, they call their position non-confrontational, which makes them sound very sweet and peace-loving. Next, relational evangelism. Relational evangelism. And the thought here is that you need to get to know someone before you'll ever have a chance at winning them to the Lord. <clears throat> I would argue sometimes the more you know someone, the harder it is to win them to the Lord. Many of you have family and friends and you've been praying for them and witnessing to them for years, but they won't listen to you anymore. But you let somebody else go and, and, and try to help and sometimes they'll give them a hearing. And we make that joke about visiting speakers coming in and people making decisions on things that I've been preaching for years, but the new voice helps and that's true. You know, we kid about it a little bit, but it's, it's actually fact. So relational evangelism and then finally servant evangelism servant evangelism. I don't know to understand the motivation behind that particular terminology there. Uh, I don't know if it's saying that those who go confrontationally soul winning are not servants of God, but whatever. A survey was conducted a number of years ago at this point uh, among young evangelicals. Evangelicals are those who are Bible believers, non-Catholics typically. They were 21 to 35 years old. 56% uh, of this group believed that lifestyle evangelism was the most effective means of evangelism. So that's more than half believed that it was most effective. They were questioned about their own results in winning people to Christ. Of the 56%, 9% said they won someone in the last 30 days. 12% said they won someone in the last 90 days. 17% said they won someone in the last six months. And 14% in the last year. So of the 56% of, of these young people that believed heavily in lifestyle evangelism, only 52% of them even won someone to the Lord. So half of the proponents won someone. Those who believe in confrontational soul winning, if you will, uh, I guarantee you had far greater success rates than that. You know, when we talk about we had 120 folks receive Christ this year so far. And for the record, when we give you the statistics, we're not bragging in any way unless we're bragging on the Lord because he's the one that gives the increase. And we know that. We've talked about that ad nauseum. So please don't ever misunderstand. Uh, 120 people. Let me ask you, of the 120 folks that received Christ this year, how many of you think of, of those would have gotten saved if we hadn't talked to them about the gospel and we just waited for them to come to us? I'm going to suggest a number. Zero. <laughs> People just don't do it, you understand. Uh, so if that's the case, then it doesn't sound like the best method of winning people to Christ to me. Here's our next statement, and it's just a statement. There's no blink. I do believe in lifestyle evangelism if you mean that we ought to live in such a way that honors Christ and represents him to the best of our ability so that the world sees a difference in the Christian and the everyday man. So if you mean lifestyle evangelism means living a consistent enough testimony that people would respect your witness, then yeah, I'm all for it. But that's not what they mean. They mean don't witness because it'll offend some. I used to hear uh, preachers make this statement in defense of, of soul winning and, and verbal uh, I keep, I'm, I'm just going to use the word confrontational because it doesn't bother me at all. It's exactly what it is, even though there's a negative spin on it. Confrontational evangelism. And they would say this rather sarcastically, what do you think I'm going to do? Send them to hell number two? And the truth is, there's a valid point to that. 
Uh, you know, now, what, what's happening is the, the lifestyle evangelism crowd is concerned that someone's going to be too abrasive with an individual. I don't know abrasive soul winners. I know some people who don't know how to read a room and sometimes they say something stupid, but almost every soul winner I know and have ever known has been someone who has a heart for the Lord and for the people they're trying to witness to. Uh, when Brother Areza was here a couple of summers ago, I was his soul winning partner one of the days we went out. And uh, I, I, it, was, you know, it was so interesting. Brother Areza, he, he, his crowd that he runs with can sometimes be deemed a, a little rough around the edges. And you know him. He's, he's not that way himself even. But the, his crowd. So I was interesting to see his witnessing technique. And uh, I've never seen a, a more gentlemanly, loving, kind soul winning presentation in all my life. Uh, you know, he would, he would see someone and, and we would try to ask them about Christ and, and we'd give them the track and he'd explain the, the revival meetings we were having. And then he'd even stop and, and, and if we were rejected and he'd say, David, could I ask you just one more time? This is a very important matter. It's, a, it's the matter of, of what's going to happen to us when we die. Could I please just take five minutes and show you just a few Bible verses. It would it'd mean the world to me if I could do that. And I, I just laying it on. And then they would say, you know, I got something on the stove or whatever the excuse was. And he'd say, okay, I understand. You don't have time right now. Please take this tract. And, and today, sometime today when you have a minute, just sit down and read it and, and see what what the Lord has for you. And there's a phone number on it. Call the pastor. He would be glad to talk to you. And I mean, as kind and gentlemanly as he could possibly be. Uh, and that's the way soul winners are. We care about people, and so we preach the gospel to them. We're not preaching hellfire damnation sermons one-on-one. -on -one. But that's the, the, per, uh, the perception so, uh, I do believe in living that kind of lifestyle, but we ought not to rely on that as the only method. I believe that you ought to live it and speak it alongside. Let's go to Matthew 16 real quickly, please. Matthew 16. We doing good tonight? All right. What did I say? Matthew 16, 5? Yeah. Dyslexic tonight I am. That was funny. <laughs> I hate that I have to tell you when it's funny. All right. Here it is. The lifestyle evangelism verse. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I believe that 100%. I preach that. You've heard me quote that verse from memory scores of times probably. We ought to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. You know what the verse doesn't say? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and ask you how to be saved. It doesn't say that. It says that God is glorified when his children are seen living godly, righteous lives. There's nothing about salvation in that verse. It's easily seen in the Bible that our good works glorify the Father to others. Glorify is the word on your blank there. Can you go to John chapter number 3? What is John chapter 3 about? Yes. Nicodemus. John chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And look what he says. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. That is Jesus living out Matthew 5.16. We don't know that Jesus and Nicodemus knew each other. I think it's doubtful that they did. But something about Jesus and his ministry got the attention of Nicodemus. And not just Nicodemus, but all of the Pharisees, right? 
And not just all of the Pharisees, all of the Sadducees, right? Not just all of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, all the scribes as well, right? And the Sanhedrin, uh, the whole council, the high priest, everyone. It got their attention. And so that's a good example of how living for God will attract the attention of people uh, regarding spiritual things. But we don't see Nicodemus getting saved here in this passage. In fact, here's how it goes. We know that thou art a teacher come from God because you do great miracles. What does Jesus do? Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's too confrontational. How, how dare Jesus pull that out, first sentence out of his mouth to Nicodemus? That's not compassionate at all. That's too confrontational. But that's what Jesus did. Do you have John chapter 4 in your Bible? What's that chapter about? Who's it about? The lady at the well. Did Jesus just hang around the well until she asked him how to go to heaven? No. He came up and said, give me some water. And she said, you're not supposed to be talking to me. He said, don't worry about that. If you'd have asked me for the kind of water I have, I'd give you water. You'd never thirst again, right? Confrontational. You have to talk to people and explain to them the gospel. So here's a statement. I don't know if this is in the blank or not. Uh, Oh, John 3, is. this is an example of lifestyle evangelism by the Savior. His good works drew Nicodemus to himself. But the woman at the well is an example of confrontational soul winning. John 4. You with me? Good. Let me read you this next statement, and it's got the blank in it here. We are to live a good life so that others may be drawn to Christ but also be speaking to people about Christ and not relying on testimony alone. And to be fair, uh, okay, so you, let's say you go to a, a cafe and they ask if you'd like some coffee. You say, sure, I would. And so they take, they take a coffee cup and they sit it down on the saucer and you can see right away some woman's red lipsticks right there on the rim of that mug. And then they fill it full of coffee. And you say, excuse me, ma'am, sir, uh, could I have a, a fresh cup for the coffee? What if they said to you, just spin it around. <laughs> the inside's clean. And just spin it around, you'll be fine. What would you do? You're not drinking that coffee, Right. You're going to send it back. You say, turn it around, friend. I know him. I know better than that. Uh, you, you're going to send it back. Why? Because you don't want to drink from a dirty vessel. It's gross. Now, have you heard of, of something called a jewel in a swine snout? Sometimes gospel messages come from uh, repugnant sources. Right? You know, let's talk about the, the whole Kanye West thing real quick. Uh, how many of you do not know who Kanye West is? Okay, just Vicky. You may as well be there. Uh, so the rest of you know the news, okay? He's, he's a rapper, uh, and, and he came out two or three years ago professing Christianity. And the trouble with celebrities who start to profess Christianity is they seem to live really wicked lives. And then they profess Christianity and nothing about their life changes. He tweeted within the last three months, my goal for this month is to abstain from pornography, abstain from fornication, abstain from cussing, and, and this list of things. Well, supposedly three years ago he got saved. So why is he still indulging in those things on a normal basis? Uh, even more recent, last week, he said, I love Hitler, just like that. 
and I love the Nazis. They're getting, they're given a bad rap, which is a very ironic thing for an African American rapper to say. Uh, but this is where he's at, and of course, there's probably some underlying mental health issues. To be fair, but my point is simply this. No one wants to drink from a dirty coffee cup, and no one wants to hear the gospel from someone who doesn't appear to embody anything holy. But this is the society and generation of Christianity we're living in today. We just gave you one of the answers, Lucy did, in Ezekiel uh, chapter 44, I think it was. The priest's job is to make a difference between the holy and the profane. Holy meaning that which abides with God, and profane is that which he is repelled by. For instance, pride is profane in the eyes of God. God resists the proud, right? Humility is holy. God, uh, he resists the proud, he gives grace to the humble. Uh, the, 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 the shenanigans we see go on, going on in, in our schools today, public school system, and these library drag queen shows, it's just, it's wicked and ungodly that these things are going on. The sexualization of children, this, this ad uh, marketing campaign that we, we read about on the news the last week or two, this is Satan at work. And so we, we stand up and we, we speak out against that. But then you've got a, a society or a group of Christians. I saw a video online this week of a Catholic priest. You know, you know how they do this, these cards? They write stuff on cards and they throw them away. Talking about God is transgender. That's blasphemy, my friend. It's incredible that someone who purports to be a man of God would make such a statement. And online, of all places, to have an audience of millions, potentially. And so there's a wickedness that's going on. And, and when, when the lost crowd hears a gospel message from an unholy source, they tend to reject it. It's seen as a joke. And so Jesus taught that we're supposed to let our light shine before men, that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Ah, uh, Let's keep moving here. The, the, a couple of stories that I, I just remember uh, happening. <clears throat> when I was in Georgia, I went up to the counter at a bank, and I'm just dressed normally, street clothes, not, not ministerially looking. And the young lady said there, are you a pastor? And I was really excited because I was a youth pastor at the time and new in the ministry. And I smiled real big. And I said, I am. How did you know that? And she said, you just have that look. And I thought, well, praise God for that. Conversely, I was in the barber chair today. And I mentioned to the barber that I was a pastor. And the barber said, oh, I didn't know that. So either I'm losing ground uh, or it just doesn't always work. So, you know, and it can go either way at any given time. But people ought to be able to tell whose team you're on. Uh, you know, I don't have time for that. Let's keep moving. So let's talk about what's wrong with this matter of lifestyle evangelism. Ready? Number one, uh, the error of saying we should only witness when the Spirit leads. The error of saying we should only witness when the Spirit leads. This is not true. Uh, look at Mark chapter number 16, verse number 15. Mark 16, verse number 15. And he said unto them, who do you think he is? Jesus. Speaking to the disciples and ultimately to all of us, go ye into all the world... And preach the gospel to everyone the Spirit leads you to. No. Every creature. Our job as Christians is to give the gospel to as many people as we possibly can. We're not only to give the gospel to the people that we believe the Spirit leads us to. See, here's the thing. If you see a guy or a lady and she's over sitting on a park bench and they're dressed nicely and seem to be mannerly, the Spirit's going to lead you to witness to them. 
But then you're going to see the, the biker who's seven foot two inches tall, and he's got a beard that's five foot and three inches long, and he's got the earring from his nose to his ear, and he's got a big knife on his side, and he has a, a motorcycle vest that says on the patch on the back, if you tell, talk to me about Jesus, I'll kill you. Uh, you're not going to feel led to witness to him, are you? We're not supposed to witness to only the people we feel led to witness to. The truth is, I know Christians who've never felt led to witness to anyone ever. We're commanded of God to witness to every creature. Not every creature to whom the Spirit leads. Letter B, the Spirit does lead us to every creature. If you want to argue that, John chapter 6 and verse 63 Jesus said, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So Jesus spoke, Mark 16, 15, that said, preach the gospel to every creature. So if you really want to go that angle, then yes, the spirit does lead you to witness to every creature. The Holy Spirit gave us the word of God, and it's he that told us to preach the gospel to every creature. The, have you ever heard of the term word of knowledge? Word of knowledge is typically spouted by charismatics, Pentecostals, assemblies of God. And what they believe is God himself is giving them information that God has never given to anyone else before. So you're, you're talking about uh, Joseph Prince, that gentleman on television. Uh, what's the guy in the white suit? Benny Hinn. Uh, these types of, of, of men uh, and women as well. There are plenty of women prophetesses in the charismatic movement. So these folks, they just they give you stuff that's, that they claim was put in their head by God himself. They consider themselves prophets in that fashion of the word. Uh, but God doesn't reveal things in that manner anymore. The Bible's clear that those gifts that were given that Paul outlines in, in 1 Corinthians, uh, they're sign gifts. The children of Israel required a sign in order to trust that the Messiah uh, was truly Jesus Christ. And so that's those miracles that Nicodemus was talking about in chapter 3 and verse number 2. <clears throat> and so uh, these, these folks that claim to have a word of knowledge, they're, they're speaking on behalf of God outside of Scripture. Now, for us to say, I have to wait for God to tell me who to witness to, that's kind of like a word of knowledge. It's charismatic leaning at the very least. Next, number two, the error that just the Bible is enough. Oh, did I miss some blanks? This, uh, the matter of the spirit leading is akin to the word of to a word of knowledge. Number one is the error of saying we should only witness when the Spirit leads. Then the final one is we have the truth that God intended us to have. You know, outside of the Word of God, there is no additional truth. That's why the book of Revelation ends with don't add to this book or take away from it. Number two, the error that just the Bible is enough. This is saying that, oh, well, all people need is the Bible and they can get saved. Let's go to Acts chapter 8 and see if that's true. Acts chapter number 8. If people can just get a hold of the word of God, they can get saved on their own. Any of you ever own a Bible before you got saved? Okay. Okay. Did you still require somebody to explain it to you in order to get saved? Yeah. Once in a blue moon, someone just through reading the Bible can come to an understanding of Christ. Kevin Wynn claims to have done that himself, but I'm still not sure he's even saved personally. Uh, verse number 37. No, where am I? 30? Oh, I'm in chapter 9. That doesn't help at all. 30, and Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. Is the prophet Isaiah in the Bible? Yeah. 
that he would, uh, let's see, oops, I missed it. And said, understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, yeah, leave me alone. <laughs> he said, how can I? Except some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come and sit with him. The place of the scripture which you read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shears. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? So he's got questions, doesn't he? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him genius, or Jesus. What a confrontational manner of going about this. Why didn't he just tell him, you have the Bible, figure it out on your own. Let's not bother this eunuch now. By the way, who brought Philip to the eunuch? The Spirit of God did. Remember he was, beam me up, Scotty. Oh boy, what else? Psalm 126.6. Psalm 126.6. Well, so much for 8 o'clock. Psalm 126.6. You know this verse, you probably have it memorized. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. What is this verse talking about? Soul winning, winning people to Christ. Those are what the sheaves are. Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. That's not on key, but those are the words. He that goeth forth and weepeth. So already someone's necessary. A person, right? He. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed. What's the precious seed? The, well, the word of God, right? Parable of the sower, four kinds of soil. The seed is the word of God, right? All right. So here you've got a person and you've got the Bible. And if the person takes the Bible and with a compassionate harps, harps, heart, I can't talk tonight, he shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him, meaning people will get saved. So, lifestyle evangelism removes the he, that going forth and preaching the gospel. Once the he is removed, the burden is gone. This, you know, and understand me for what I'm saying here, this book itself holds no burden for souls. Does that make sense? The written word of God. Have you ever laid down on a bed in a hotel and had the drawer pop open and that Gideon Bible hop up on the nightstand and say, hey, if you'll read me, I'll tell you how to go to heaven. I know we're being nonsensical almost about it, aren't we? Well, that's the point. To say that, that people explaining the gospel to a, a lost person is unnecessary is asinine. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. So you get rid of the he, then you get rid of the burden. Who carries the burden to win people to Christ? We do. We're the ones who want to see them saved. If we didn't, we wouldn't be here tonight. We wouldn't come out on Thursday nights for the soul winning bus. We wouldn't go visit our absentees. We wouldn't show up on Saturday morning. We wouldn't support missionaries. We do all of those things because God's put a love in our heart for lost people. And so... You take away the he, you take away the burden. After that, it's not long that the Bible's gone. Andy Stanley has already said the Old Testament is unnecessary and we should stop beating people over the head with the Bible. He's almost as a pastor. Do you know who Andy Stanley is? He's Charles Stanley's son. He pastors a big church on the north side of Atlanta. And, uh, and by big church, I mean, I don't know, two or three thousand, something like that. And I can show you a video clip after video clip of Andy Stanley getting up and saying the Bible is not necessary in the life of a Christian and shouldn't be used as a weapon against lost people. And I would agree it's nice to be used as a weapon against them, although it is a sword. Hmm? You don't beat people up with it, but man, it has the key to life. <laughs> this man wouldn't have faith if it weren't for the word of God. It's just, it's all part of Satan's plan to water down truth. Number three, the error of those who say, if I live right, people will initiate the conversation. 
If I live right, people will initiate the conversation. I'm going to go a little bit out of order so that you can uh, go chronologically through your Bible. Not chronologically, but you know what I mean. John 19, or I'm sorry, Luke 19.5. Let's go to Luke 19.5 first. Luke 19.5. Luke 19.5, and when Jesus came to the place, <clears throat> he looked up and, set, uh, and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. How much conversation did Jesus and Zacchaeus have before this? None. Who initiated the conversation? Jesus did. Look at John chapter 4, please. John 4, you're going to move forward from Luke 19. John chapter 4, who's in this chapter? Lady at the well. Verse number 7. Then cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. How much conversation did Jesus have with the woman at the well before this verse? None. Who initiated the conversation? Jesus did. John chapter 5. Verse number six, <clears throat> when Jesus saw him lie, this is a lame man lying there, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, wilt thou be made whole? What did these two have to say to each other before that statement? Nothing. Nothing. Who initiated the conversation? Jesus. Jesus did. Acts chapter number eight, verse 30, we've already turned there, you don't have to turn to it again. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Do you remember who initiated the conversation? Okay, let's go there. Acts chapter 8. Let's go there and look. I'm right here. I'll read it to you. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Who initiated the conversation? Philip did. Acts chapter number 16. Verse number 28. This is the Philippian jailer. The jailer uh, is ready to kill himself because the earthquake and the prisoner's jail cell doors are open. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. What did these two say to each other prior to that statement? Nothing. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's the only instance in the Bible where a lost person asked a saved person how to be saved. The only place. And Paul initiated that conversation. In the Bible, when you see people come to Christ, it is always because a saved person brought the gospel message to that person and verbally confronted them with the gospel. Every time. Every time. But what are we going to do? We're going to reinvent the wheel. We're going to make it square. You know how many people get saved because they come to you and ask you how to be saved? Hardly any. In my lifetime, I can't ever remember anyone asking me how to go to heaven without me bringing the subject up first. And on top of that, I'm a pastor. People tend to lean that way conversantly with me anyhow. Number four, the error that says soul winning is just for the preacher. The error that says soul winning is just for the preacher. We don't have to do any witnessing. That's his job. That's what he gets paid for. Yeah, that's all over the Bible. Everyone is to be a soul winner. The Great Commission uh, says to preach the gospel. Let me flip my sheet. The Great Commission says preach the gospel. That word preach means to spread or evangelize. It is meant for men and for women. Now the Bible says that women aren't to be pastors or, or teach or preach to men in the church but they are to be soul winners and spread the gospel. All of us are, men and women. <clears throat> there are portions of the word of God that mention 
ladies prophesying or preaching, and that is referring to soul winning. Every one of us is to spread the word of God and spread the gospel. Just like COVID-19. Get out there and spread it. Number five. The error that says we should do away with public and door-to-door soul winning. We've already read it. I'll read it to you again. Acts chapter 20, verse number 20. It's an easy verse to remember because of 2020 vision, right? I've seen church literature that said, we have an Acts 2020 vision. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, taking the gospel to people's homes to teach them what Jesus did for them is scriptural. Verse 42 of Acts chapter 5. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Nothing we've read tonight from the Bible expresses any truthfulness about don't confront people with the gospel. Everything we've read has said, confront people with the gospel. And again, by confront, we don't mean that in a harsh sense. We don't mean grab them and shake them and tell them you're going to get saved whether you like it or not. I'll put you in a headlock and give you a noogie. That's not what we're talking about. But we are talking about, hey, could I show you from the Bible what God says about going to heaven someday? Would that be okay? Could I take a few minutes Oh, too confrontational. Okay, I'll just sit and wait for them to ask me then. And then they're going to die and they're going to go to hell. Because I was too cowardly to bring up the subject. Or I believed I might offend them and, and, and then they would not want anything to do with it. Look, if that offends you to the point of never wanting anything to do with Christianity, then you're one sensitive little person. If I say to you, could I show you some verses from the Bible that explain how you can know for sure you're on your way to heaven someday? If that is that offensive to you that you want nothing to do with Christianity, you probably weren't going to ever get saved in the first place. But as the watchman, I have a responsibility to tell you, don't I? I believe in door-to-door soul winning. I believe in person-to-person soul winning. I even believe in street preaching if it's done the right way. I've seen people stand on the side of the road and yell at cars as they drive by. That's not the right way. (laughs) But if you go downtown, you go to, I've been to Boston, I've been to Faneuil Square down in Boston. It's a large marketplace. There are people out there doing street performances and street art and that kind of thing. And I've also seen people, guy get up on a milk crate and preach and give his testimony while soul winners are talking to people and passing out tracts. They gather a crowd and listen and hear. It's so kind of what we do at, at the bus station when we can get in there. We go in there and we start passing out tracks and talking to people. That's publicly. Go to a park, spread out, pass out tracks, witness. That's publicly. This is how God tells us to win the world to Christ. He doesn't say, you know what, just clean yourself up real good, look really good and sharp, you know, portray Christianity really well, and they're going to they're gonna beat your door down asking you how to get saved. It's not reality. Go preach. That's what the Great Commission says. Uh, Oh, is there a number six? There is a number six. The error that says we should not persuade people to be saved. The error that says we should not persuade people to be saved. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 11. Knowing therefore... The terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Huh, that kind of debunks that one right away, doesn't it? And Luke 14, verse number 16. Luke 14, verse number 16. Then he said unto them, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time, to live righteously before them that they might desire the supper. It doesn't say that. That was one of my poorer renditions of the opposite. He sent his servant 
to say, come, for all things are now ready. And you know the parable of the, uh, the man who prepared the supper. What happens there? He, they, they all make excuses and they don't go. And then he says, the servant, uh, came, uh, let's see, the servant came and showed his Lord these things. Verse 21, the master being angry said, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the cities and bring in hither the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. Verse 23, the Lord said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. Watch this. I know you. You're compelled to get saved right now, aren't you? Look at me. Godly pastor. Oh, better yet, I'm going to amp it up. (laughs) Oh, actually, that might be a little offensive. Let's go back to this. That's nonsense. Can we agree? Lifestyle evangelism as the only means of winning people to Christ is nonsense. Now, you know our stand. Do right. Live right. Treat people right, separate from the world, live holy and clean and godly in an unrighteous world, and then kindly and lovingly preach the gospel to every creature with your mouth. All right, that's all I got for you. Ushers, come on down. Let's receive the offering. Three more weeks of Enemies of Soul Winning. One of these weeks we're going to cover the subject of tongues. I know that that's a a little bit of a a questionable subject for some of you. And by that I mean you have questions about it. So hopefully we'll help with that. All right, please give generously. Everything that comes in goes to fuel buses. What did we spend on bus fuel this week? $405? Two Two buses, $405. So no relief in sight there. So please give and help. Dad, would you pray for the offering? Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, Announcements are, we're praying for those who are struggling during the Christmas season. You all know that those that have lost loved ones or tend to get a little depressed or they're alone and lonely, please be in prayer for them and show them some love and kindness. It'll cheer them, I promise. Beginners, uh, you're finishing the book of Ezekiel this week, 21 through 48. I will be burning the quiz and effigy and trying to come up with a better one next time around. Advanced readers, we're reading 1st and 2nd Kings, both books in totality. Saturday morning soul winning at 10 a.m., Sunday school 9.30 on Sunday morning service 10 uh, 10 30 year to date 120 folks have received christ as savior 41 of them have been baptized last week's offering was 32 51 80 uh decent week not great but decent we're still collecting snack cakes lucy found some for 50 or 99 cents fantastic we do have about 60 snack cakes. We don't need a ton more. Uh, so, you know, do what you'd like to do. Uh, are they wrapped, Lucy? Did you, did you notice downstairs? None of them are wrapped. Okay, so if you want to wrap some snack cakes, snack cakes, they're downstairs. If you want to buy some and wrap them, if you can only buy them, just bring them in. We'll figure out a way to wrap them up. Uh, then, happy birthday, Jesus offering is a week from Sunday. Christmas Eve service, 7 o'clock candlelight service one hour here and then january family emphasis month and january the first great start sunday kick the year off right by being in the house of god all right thank you for being here everybody you are dismissed we'll see you sunday